Introducing the world's first all-electric super truck, the revolutionary GMC Hummer EV. With no limits, no emissions, and no equals, it will leave everything you thought possible in a cloud of dust. Those were a few seconds from a promotional video for General Motors' new Hummer EV. 1,000 horsepower and 0 to 60 in 3 seconds. Isn't it incredible? You can have a 5-ton SUV that will dominate nature. And it's so green. The website says zero emissions. Dave, I think you're dreaming some surprising truths about our transportation footprint next on the Growth Busters podcast. Calling, 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 calling. Call the Growth Busters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to Growth Busters, the podcast that dares to tell the full truth about how unsustainable our civilization has become and what it's going to take to recover from our growth addiction. Growth in consumption, economic growth, urban growth, population growth. That's a lot of growth busting on our plate. Yes, it is. And I'm glad you're here to help, Erica. I'm Dave Gardner, the filmmaker behind the Growth Busters documentary. And I'm Erica Arias, glad to be co-hosting. This episode is the third in our series about our travel footprint. I don't know if you're sick of it yet, Erica. I'm not, but we do have other things to get on to. Soon in 2021, we will move on from travel. But first, a quick note. The Growth Busters Project is a nonprofit that is fueled completely by your generous charitable contributions. So as you make your year-end giving decisions, please remember Growth Busters. Just hit the donate button at growthbusters.org or click the link that we'll have left for you in the show notes. And on this episode, again, we invited Mr. Joshua Spodek to join us for this conversation because next to Dave, I think he should be on your list of people to look to if you're trying to shrink your travel footprint and specifically if you're looking for creative solutions that will change the world. Yeah, I'm really glad to have Joshua back. It never fails to be a kind of an interesting and surprising conversation whenever he's in the room. You know, he's got a new podcast called This Sustainable Life. We'll put a link in the show notes to that if you're interested in checking out what Joshua's doing. We had this conversation with Joshua on November 11th, and it just took us a while to finally get around to editing it and publishing it. And don't blame Erica. It's all Dave Gardner's fault because he's had too much on his plate. Erica's been pressuring me saying, come on, Dave, we need an episode. We need an episode. Sorry to make you wait, Erica. <laughs> you have a lot to cover, Dave. It's totally fine. All right. So here's that conversation. Okay. So in this episode, we're going to just get down to the nuts and bolts of some information to help you make decisions about how you move about, you know, if you must move about. In our last episode, we had a great conversation with Josh Spodek about the joy he's experiencing of not flying and the other ways that he's traveling. And we'll definitely talk about that and the doors that that opens up. But we thought we would find an expert that we could interview who had, you know, made it their life's work to crunch numbers, run spreadsheets and figure out what's going to have the smallest carbon footprint, depending on how many miles you're going and how many of you are going and all that. And we really kind of failed at that. The closest thing to it, we did find that the Union of Concerned Scientists did a study a while back and came up with a cheat sheet that we'll talk about a little bit. That's the closest thing to that that we found. And no experts. So you guys are going to sort of interview me in a way. And I'll just start out by saying this is important because if you graph the various sectors of the economy or of human behavior for carbon footprint, transportation is the biggest. It's huge. 28%, right? 28% in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's also something we have more control over. It's tough to stop eating food or heating your home, but travel is a little more discretionary. Yeah. I don't think we need to talk about why we're talking about shrinking our footprint. The debate's kind of over about climate change. And we know that, you know, our goal is to try to keep our world from, you know, the climate from warming so much that it just completely turns our world upside down and eliminates many of us from the planet. It's not looking real promising that we're going to stay within the carbon budget that the scientists tell us we need to stay in. So every effort we can make to change our ways would make the scientists a little bit more optimistic about that, and hopefully they'd change their tune. So we know why we're doing it. We don't need to argue about that. If I can throw in, it's not just 
climate because there's also, if you look at places where people are digging oil out of the ground or extracting minerals, these are not pleasant places to be, but often they were before that stuff. So there's a lot of environmental degradation that happens besides climate. And cultural change of places where a lot of tourists end up, they become tourist traps. Absolutely. Yeah. And the culture that was once there doesn't often withstand a world of billions of people visiting. Yep, that too. So we're confronted daily with choices about how we're going to move around. And so just locally, getting to work, getting to the supermarket, used to be, you know, going out with friends. We're not getting to do very much of that these days. We've been kind of forced, you know, to shrink our carbon footprint in the transportation department because of COVID, which is good. And we're learning how silly it was that we were moving so many people to offices every day you know, and putting most of them in these tons of steel to get them there and that they can do the same job without ever leaving the house. I probably speak for all three of us when we say our hope is that we don't completely revert back to the old ways once the COVID scare is behind us. But a lot of people just think they're stuck. You know, they think that they have no choice but to get in an automobile and drive to the office or get in an automobile and drive to the supermarket. And Erica, you're the probably the first person to tell us, well, not so. In Southern California, you can do it. And I am an example of that. So if I can do it, you can do it too. <laughs> you have been car free now for how many months? Sold my car in June, I think officially, but I did a little social experiment where I just stopped driving for about a month before. So yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. So you're about a half a year there. And I think for a while there, you were, you know, feeling like, well, when I need to go somewhere, I'm going to have to get a ride. But I heard you earlier today talking about you're going to use your own two feet to get somewhere. Yeah, I just moved again, actually. And it's awesome because now I actually think about when I'm looking for somewhere to live, I'm looking at like, what's local? Where can I walk? Because if I need to go to the grocery store or, you know, run any sort of errands, then I want to know that I can walk there. I don't need to get in the car or even Uber because I live so close. So if I run out of something, I can just buy what I need. That makes for less food waste at the end of the week. And I just go back and get what I need at the end of the week. So yeah, I'm into it. That's pretty cool. And I think a lot of people in the past probably didn't think that hard about where they work and choosing their home based on where they work. You know, I can't tell you how many people think that a 30 minute drive to get to work is normal and they're thrilled that it's 30 minutes and not 90 minutes. And the fact is, if you change jobs and suddenly you're faced with instead of a 10 minute walk to work. Now you're looking at a 45 minute drive to work. That might be a good reason to move maybe. Because think about how many hours of your life you're spending transporting yourself. And I hope to see a shift maybe next year. It's already starting to happen where some people are closer to permanently working from home. And there's a little bit of research right now. People are looking at what are the pros and cons of working from home for, you know, for certain professions. You can't obviously work from home if you are a preschool teacher, but well, I mean, I'm tutoring a four-year-old and I'm doing it on Zoom. It's really hard, but you know, it's something. Yeah. So you got to go to the supermarket. You can drive, but you could also walk. You could bicycle. You might take the bus depending on the logistics of that. You could carpool. You could, you know, team up. You know, it could be that you and two of your neighbors carpool to the market if you have to take an automobile. So there are ways of reorganizing your life to shrink your carbon footprint when you do need to use a motor vehicle, right? Mm hmm You know, that reminds me of when I redid my floors a couple of years ago. I kept the old flooring and put it on Craigslist for free for anyone who wanted to get it. And a couple of people contacted me and said they would wanted it. So one guy was like, okay, I'll come pick it up. And we scheduled a time for him to pick it up and he doesn't show up. And I call him and he's like, oh, traffic. He had a van, right? He got stuck in traffic. And he's like, sorry, I can't get it. So I go to the next person on the list and he says he'll come. And so we schedule some time and he doesn't show up. And he's like, oh, it's raining or something like that. So he can't make it. So I go to the next person on the list and it's this woman who rides a bike with a trailer over. And this is like hundreds of pounds of stuff to carry. And the woman with the bike shows up and the guys with the vans don't show up. I have to say, I did not expect someone with a bike to show up. So I, if it was the guys with the vans, I would have been like, you guys figure out how to get it from my place into the van. But with her, I was like, I'm going to help you. That is so cool. So one of the things that I found that was interesting when I decided, okay, Dave, you're going to have to develop some expertise on this, was that a family of four 
flying to Orlando from Chicago for a family vacation. In that one vacation, they could possibly have a bigger carbon footprint than a year's worth of commuting to work. Now, the secret to that was that they flew first class and that they didn't fly direct from Chicago to Orlando. And so much of flying these days is like that. You know, you're shopping for the cheapest flight and we've got this hub and spoke system for the airline. So it's not that unusual that you would fly. In this case, this family flies from Chicago to Houston and then to Orlando. A bit of a waste of time and a bit of a waste of jet fuel. But doing that, adding those extra miles and flying first class made it so that one family, just their round trip flight was more than a year's worth of commuting in terms of carbon footprint. thought that was pretty interesting. I would suspect that most people listening to this are not flying first class. They might be. But right there, that's going to jam things up in a way that's not necessary. Yeah. And why is it more first class? Same airplane. Well, it's because the more people there are in first class, the fewer people there are on the plane to share the carbon footprint of that trip. So it's the weight and the space of a first class seat makes your footprint a lot bigger. Now, some people, I think that you guys might find this interesting. I have conversations with adult kids and stepkids about this kind of thing all the time because they know I'm kind of Mr. You know, don't get on a plane if you don't have to. And the first thing that they'll say to me is, well, the plane's going there anyway. If you have hundreds of customers engaging in this behavior, you're going to have hundreds of flights you know, to meet that demand. And if you have a lot fewer customers, you're going to cut back on the flights. So that flight might be scheduled next week to go there, whether it's empty or full. But over the long haul, the airline is not going to run planes, you know, between cities that aren't filling up with passengers. You have a lot of agency in this. You know, your behavior can determine whether, you know, how many flights there are in the air next year. I want to mention how my mom lives about 100 miles northwest of the city. So before COVID, when I would go there, I'd take a bus from Port Authority and it'd be a couple hours. For me, a bus ride feels like a fair amount of pollution. So I would think to myself, oh, is that going to pollute? And then I think, oh, the bus is going to go. And then I stop and I'm like, oh, that's the same thing. <laughs> I, I'm thinking the same way that they do. And I had Michael Moss, the author of this book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Learned to Hook Us. And he had this amazing phrase. There's something that you know is right, that you believe is right, but it's easier to do the other thing. That's the addiction talking. And that phrase has become part of my vocabulary. That's the addiction talking. You know, you just want one more jolt. And if you can find a reason to justify it, you'll go for it. And it doesn't have to be really plausible. It can be specious and fatuous, but your mind accepts it as long as you don't say it out loud or to someone who's like thought about it before. And that's how we operate. I think that's the human mind. It's like, it's going to fly anyway. That's what you say all the time, Dave, when you say that we have power with how we spend our money and what we spend our money on. So yeah, the Twinkies at the grocery store are there, but if I don't buy them and then that encourages other people to also not buy them because they're horrible, it's doof, right, Josh? Big smile. <laughs> <laughs> then, sorry, Twinkies, no more. Nobody will be making Twinkies anymore and that will be better. They will go away, yeah. You know the old adage, vote with your pocketbook. They didn't come up with that out of the blue. So like I said, the best resource I found for deciding, you know, whether you're going to take the bus, take the plane, take the car, take the train. The Vacation Traveler Carbon Guide from Union of Concerned Scientists is the best resource that I found so far. Now, the study they did was back in 2008, and that was a while back. So I think some things will have changed, but my guess is that the overall comparisons among the different modes of transportation probably are going to hold for the most part true because I think buses may have gained a little bit of efficiency just like airplanes have gained a little bit of efficiency and trains have hopefully gained a little bit of efficiency. Automobiles is another whole conversation that I think we should have because now we're kind of in the process of moving toward electric vehicles and that's a conversation I think we should have. But I'll put in a link in the show notes. You can find this one-page cheat sheet and you can find the full study behind it if you really want to get into the details. But it's got a really great 
chart. And what they do is they give you what's best and what's worst in terms of carbon footprint. If you're traveling by yourself or if there are two of you traveling or if there are four of you traveling, and it makes a difference. And then the other thing that makes a difference in their table here is if you're just going 100 miles versus 500 miles or 1,000 miles or more. And the rankings kind of surprise me that the rankings actually change a little bit depending on whether it's just one of you or four and whether it's a short trip or a long trip. Josh, you mentioned taking the bus. I was a little surprised. I thought the train was going to be the best across the board, but it's actually taking the bus, a motor coach. Yeah, for inner city stuff, it can be. I mean, buses, you can, the density of people is very high, which I think is what gets them to work very well. Good point. Good point. But then here's an interesting thing that changes. So in second place is taking the train for a solo traveler on a 100-mile journey. If you're traveling 500 miles, the train is still in second place. But if you're going 1,000 miles or more, guess what? Flying economy beats taking the train for carbon footprint shrinkage. And I was shocked at that. It actually makes more sense to get on an airplane, I hate to say that, than the train. I also wonder if it might be different in Europe versus the U.S. If they have a more comprehensive system, it might be more people riding on it might make it less per person for the train. I mean, going over mountains makes a difference for a train, but not a plane. Well, it would be interesting to see whether that has changed any, especially because I want to keep Josh off those airplanes. I don't want to give him any excuse. And if it's a close call, then you should do what's more fun. The train is a whole lot more fun. A year ago, I was supposed to speak at, or actually earlier this year, I was supposed to speak at the Intermountain Sustainability Summit in Ogden, Utah, and it was in April. So it ended up being done virtually because of COVID. But when I was making my travel arrangements, that wasn't the case. I was going to be out there in person, and I really wanted to keep my footprint down. So I, not having found this chart, I was just sure that the responsible thing for me to do would be to take the train. As it happened, I was lucky. I knew I could catch a train in Denver. I'm an hour from Denver and take the train to Salt Lake City. You know, the train was actually going where I wanted it to go. But I thought, man, that's just going to be a lot more expensive and it's going to take a lot longer. Well, I was surprised to find one, you know, it was going to take me a day, not 24 hours, but less than 24 hours, but it's going to tie me up for a day. And when you think about it, by the time you drive to the airport or take a shuttle to the airport and go through the whole dehumanizing experience of going through security and, you know, waiting at the gate and loading and then waiting for your baggage on the other end, you know, it's kind of a day anyway, in a lot of cases, you know, you've basically aced out a day to make that travel anyway. But the thing that really shocked me was I found that the train was cheaper than the flight. The train was really affordable, as long as you weren't insisting on having a big sleeper car or something like that. Since you mentioned Salt Lake City, and I took the train to Salt Lake City to give that talk a couple of years ago. Also in Salt Lake City, I took public transit, a train to a bus to ski. And all the buses there and the trains have ski racks. So I could rent the skis near the hotel, get on the train, take that to a bus. The bus took me right to the mountain. And it was easy. And $2, I don't remember the price, but it was really cheap. And it was not inconvenient. It was easy. There you go. There you go. The other thing I've learned from reading this study and doing this research is that the biggest part of the climate disrupting footprint of air travel is takeoffs and landings. So finding a direct flight can be a lot greener than doing two legs or three legs. Makes a big difference. Okay, so here's an interesting thing. So let's say you've got a family of four. And this has been a conversation I've had many times with family because some of my family loves road trips. It's unbearable to me to spend, you know, 12 hours in a car. Don't want to do that. I'm spoiled. The car, 12 hours with your family. If it's in a car. (laughs) Opportunity to save yourself right now. (laughs) 12 hours with the family in the car. No, thank you. (laughs) But let's say you've got a family of four that even in an SUV, your carbon footprint will be less if you drive that family of four than even rail. Better than the train, better than air, obviously. Even an SUV, you know, if you're splitting it among, you know, four ways, that that beats the train, which surprised me. But general rule, low carbon emissions would be bus, train, a hybrid or electric automobile, and flying coach on narrow jets. Medium emissions category would be a traditional car or flying coach on a regional jet. And then the highest emissions activities or modes of travel would be an SUV or flying first class. So that's pretty easy and pretty easy to remember. 
And why would anybody get an SUV, Dave? You really want to get me started on that? I do, really. That was what I took out of your PowerPoint. And I thought, who thinks these are sexy? Because when I see them, no, that's like a hard no. So here's my confession, Josh. So Erica knows already. Maybe you do too now. But, you know, I had two kids from my first marriage. And then I got a vasectomy because I was concerned about overpopulation. I thought I was doing my part. But I was becoming a dad right about the time that the minivan was invented. The minivan was... Like a miracle. I mean, everybody who had kids had a minivan. And I just couldn't bear the idea of me driving a minivan. I had to have an SUV because it was just, you know, my macho self-image. I'm sorry, I confess. I was in that mode, you know, fortunately have gotten out of that. But you know how it is. So much of our society is into status consumption. We buy things based on the status that we think it conveys on us. And I wanted to be seen in, you know, in a four-wheel drive vehicle, not in a minivan, because I felt like I would be emasculated if I was in a minivan. My mom did too, honestly. Maybe not emasculated, but she saw those and she did not want to be caught in a minivan. So she had to get a Lincoln Navigator. But yeah, that's what we drove around in when I was growing up. But it was it was huge. It fit, honestly, more than what needed to fit in one car. There were only two of us. So yeah. And now my mom has all kids out of the nest, but she wants another one. And I'm convincing her not to get that. <laughs> I have to work on her. When they came out with the Hummer... Man, that was full of testosterone. Man, I wanted one of those. I was asleep. I had lost touch of my conservation ethic. And, you know, I could go weeks, months, maybe even years without even thinking about climate change, as so many people were then. And too many people are even today. Of course, today, you know, I don't go an hour without thinking about, you know, whether my behavior is as light on the planet as possible. It's crazy about me turning off the lights when I leave the room. People think we're never home because there's never more than one light on in the house. I mean, I'm just obsessive compulsive about it. And so I'm glad I couldn't afford a Hummer. I want to apologize for having driven a, you know, a Jeep Cherokee and, you know, a Ford Bronco 2. And, you know, the truth is the minivan is sort of in the same category as the SUVs in terms of being bigger and heavier and having a bigger carbon footprint but I apologize. So I want to comment on when you said you got a vasectomy because you don't want to overpopulate. Well, there's lots of ways to not have kids. So the vasectomy means you like sex because you could always choose abstinence. (laughs) Busted. (laughs) Well, you're implying some sort of feeling emasculated. I'm thinking it sounds very masculine. If I was going to be masculine and very attractive to the opposite sex, I wanted to make sure that I could do something with that attraction, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) That's definitely the dream guy for me, and he's not here. So, yeah, there should be something like that, an advertisement. (laughs) Who is the dream guy? Tell us. Describe the dream guy. He has a vasectomy, or at least he's child-free, at least. And he doesn't drive an SUV or a minivan, right? Exactly, yes. In fact, he's Mm car-free. And he's really smart. I had LASIK a long time ago. Josh, I hate to tell you this, but that does not make you sterile. (laughs) I thought that it gave me better vision, but it didn't give me better vision. What it really did was make me not have to wear glasses. So it's not that the vasectomy stops you from having kids. There's lots of ways you can do that. It enables you to do it with more pleasure. We sort of jumped into automobiles, which I think is a good place to spend some time. There's one other thing about flights that I wanted to mention, that it made a difference what kind of an aircraft. You know, there are more efficient aircraft and less efficient aircraft. And, of course, they're working on electric aircraft. Maybe they'll figure out a way to really fly us through the air using electricity and somehow be able to lift the batteries into the air to power that. I wouldn't really bet the farm on that. And that's going to be a long ways off, I think, if they do that. In the midterm, the airlines are looking at biofuel in order to come up with better metrics. So it looks like their carbon footprint is lower. But as we learned from watching Planet of the Humans, that biofuels are so imperfect that that's not a good You know, I don't think you can be guilt-free about powering your transportation with biofuels. Going back to the addiction speaking, a lot of people when they hear that electric planes might happen someday, they start to think, oh, okay, well, this one's not quite electric yet, but it's almost there. The plane that you are on is not electric. And even if they're electric planes, for them to be solar powered is not very likely. But the battery, like, this is not going to happen for a long time. So it's very tempting to feel like, well, it's just the engineers aren't quite there, but it's okay for me. It's very tempting to feel that way. Yeah. And so 
it's far enough off, and if it ever happens, that I don't think the answer to that is, well, we just keep on flying and wait for the technology to solve the problem. We've got to change our behavior, like Josh did. Thank you, Josh, for doing that. we got to fly less. Yeah, and the more that you fly with jet fuel, the more they're going to keep doing jet fuel. They respond to the demand. Yep. And if that's what there's demand for, they'll supply that. And if they see that that demand goes down, they're going to be like, oh, we got to do something different. Yep. Great circuit that we took and valuable information. But where I was going was that there are some websites where you can book travel and you can find an itinerary that has the smaller carbon footprint that evaluates how many stops plus whether it's on efficient aircraft or, you know, really wasteful aircraft. So I know one of them, and I'll put a link in the show notes, is skyscanner.com, where you can actually, if you've got to fly, but you want to try to fly as green as you can, that might be a way to do it where you can at least try to choose more carefully. thought that was kind of interesting. All right, back to cars. A few days ago, I was kind of enjoying watching the motorcade for Joe Biden pulling up to the convention center where he was going to deliver his victory speech in the U.S. presidential election. And you know, it's not even a bunch of limos anymore. Every one of those vehicles in the motorcade, whenever you see motorcade of politicians, they are all Lincoln Navigators. They're all huge SUVs, Cadillac Escalades, monsters. So I think it would be a really neat gesture for Joe Biden, for his motorcades to suddenly be little Nissan Leaf, tiny little electric vehicles or something like that. Now, I know that's not going to be feasible because, you know, they'll be really heavy by the time they make them bulletproof and bombproof. Do you guys know about Bill de Blasio here in New York City? He's from Brooklyn and he lives now in the mayor's mansion in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I think every day he takes a motorcade to his old gym in Brooklyn. And the whole city hates this. It's like the entitlement of this. The leadership aspect of it is, I mean, you got to type traffic and things like that. And it's not like the mansion is it's like a crappy place to live. Like there's not gyms around there. And he can do bodyweight stuff anyway. I've been reading a bunch of articles about what Biden can do for the environment. And all the articles talk about what he can do in terms of his authority by executive fiat. Now, even if you accept that what one person does doesn't matter, which I do not accept, the president of the United States is not a person. This is a person that everybody views. And if he chooses to do things personally, it can be far more effective. Well, whether it's more effective or not, it's very effective that can influence the world. One big example is President Carter put solar panels on the White House and he wore sweaters and said, you can turn on the heat. That was a signal to the world. Now, Reagan took them down. That was also a signal. That was also a leadership move in a different direction. So Biden and Harris, they can do things that are way more influential, possibly more influential than executive orders of you know, setting policy because you can get nations and globally people to change their behavior and their perspectives. There you go. Anyway, there's hope that that White House might actually go through the thought process of thinking about that and evaluating that. So for the last four years, there hasn't been any consideration given to that kind of reason to behave differently. So the heaviest SUV is about five times the carbon emissions of just a hybrid car. So we can't diss the SUV any more than we already have, I don't think. I do like to do a diatribe about pickup trucks because that's another thing. I see so many pickup trucks driving around in the city, nothing in the bed, one driver. You know, pickup truck comes in handy every now and then when it's time to move or you got to go pick up some sheetrock for a remodeling project or something like that. But for that to be your just everyday get around vehicle, pickup trucks are not setting the world on fire in terms of being green. They are setting the world on fire in a different sense. Yes, they are, aren't they? You know, so one thing you could consider doing is, well, you park the pickup truck and just get it out when you need it. So 28 days a month, you're taking the bus or riding a bike or driving in a small electric vehicle or something like that. That's good. And then you only take the truck when you need to. And then that begs the calculation of, well, what about the embedded energy then? Of I've got two vehicles now and it took energy. There is a carbon footprint of just manufacturing those two vehicles. Wouldn't we be better off if I just had the pickup truck and did away with the embedded energy of manufacturing that second more fuel efficient auto? Yeah, to use something infrequently, that's a rental. I mean, if you rent it, then you can get a big one one time, a small one another time, or maybe have some friends that you share I mean, I don't know about cars, but 
people have tool libraries and things like that. I mean, with book libraries and things. So when I need tools, I go to my super because I live in an apartment building. For me to buy the tools doesn't make sense. Perfect solution. Yeah, because then you don't need to garage it either, that extra vehicle. You have that garage space or you don't even have that garage. So if I decided I had to have a pickup truck and renting didn't make sense, well, the thing I would do would be I would get four friends or neighbors and say, let's go in on a pickup truck. And people are doing that today, that kind of thing. They're going in on a chainsaw or a snowblower or some other kinds of tools that it just doesn't make any sense for every household to have all of those things. And there is embedded energy. There is a carbon footprint involved in manufacturing each of those items. You can also get a smaller home and therefore need less stuff. Yes, sir. Yep. And if it's built really well, then you don't need tools that often to repair it. Interesting thing, SUVs, back to them. Second largest source of increased carbon emissions over the past decade. Wow. Blows me away. But what about electric vehicles? Now, I happen to live in a part of the country that's a little bit behind where we still have two coal-burning power plants generating some of our electricity in my community, and I'm ashamed of that. And finally, our utility is making plans to clean up their act there. But my thinking all along, when I see people in my community who have gone with an all-electric vehicle, I'm thinking, wow, do you really think you're doing something for the environment? You're plugging that in and charging it with coal-fired electricity. So I was really curious to learn more about that. And it turns out that an electric vehicle is twice as efficient as a gasoline-powered vehicle. So even if you're charging your electric vehicle with dirty power, you're still shrinking your carbon footprint a little bit. Now, obviously, the best way to shrink your carbon footprint would be to have an electric vehicle that you charge off of solar panels so that there's no coal being burned or natural gas being burned to generate that electricity. But, of course, there are other factors. Assuming it's not a biking distance that you're traveling. Exactly. And there's no public transit. Yes. Thank you. And that the trip is necessary. Yeah. There's all those other calculations that need to go into that. And I'm afraid people... They just go buy an electric vehicle and they kind of wear that as a badge of greenness and they never even do the mental calculations to consider what their other options would have been for transportation, sadly. They get the moral license, as the psychologists say. Yeah. So if we have to have vehicles, going electric is a good way to go. And the grid is getting cleaner. So even if you have to charge it off the grid, it's still better than a gas-powered vehicle. But the other calculation you have to do is, let's say you've got a gas-powered automobile in the garage right now. Do you just dump that? You might have five more good years with it or 10 more good years. Are you better off to dump that and get an electric vehicle because of the embedded energy, the cost of manufacturing that electric vehicle has to be filtered into the equation. And, you know, isn't it sad that, you know, we're approaching 8 billion people on the planet. We've filled up the planet so much that we have to go through all of those gyrations. We have to carefully consider, do the math. We've got to hire some mathematician to do those calculations for us because otherwise we're just going to commit suicide for our civilization. Yeah, I see that people look to make things more and more efficient. But if you don't stop growth, what's his name? Um, The Nobel Prize winner, Norman Borlaug, when he got his Nobel Prize for the Green Revolution, he said, all this did is buy us a little temporary time to figure out population, because if we don't, then we're just going to get back here soon enough. He then said, but I'm sure we'll figure that out, which we have not. The thing is, if you keep growing, efficiency under a growth model leads to scarcity. Efficiency plus growth leads to scarcity. It leads to things like eating cockroaches. I'm vegan. I haven't eaten meat since 1990. But if people want to eat meat, If there's not so many people, you can eat meat without it affecting the environment. But if you keep growing, then it's cockroaches. Exactly. Yep. So how far are we willing to go in order to avoid dealing with the uh, elephant in the room, which is the population part of it? You know, we get plenty of opportunities to talk about population growth and overpopulation. You talk about it all the time. I rarely get to talk about it. So I'm indulging myself in sharing something that makes total sense to me. But most people, it doesn't make sense to them yet. 
Yeah. And most of the time we get to talk about it over on the other podcast that Erica and I co-host, the Overpopulation Podcast. We might as well put a plug in for that because it's really good work. I'm proud of the conversations we're having over there. And uh, It sounds like we have to invite Josh on to join us for that podcast too. We should. I was going to say I, I concur to Dave and now I'm going to say I concur to Erica. Yeah. But, you know, it's an uncomfortable subject for a lot of people. They don't want to deal with it. And so the price is then that you are on track to, you won't even be able to have a burger twice a year, you will be getting your protein from cricket powder. And that's not the worst of it. If we also stop population growth, because if we keep population growth, it doesn't matter what we do, then we'll just be vegans with miserable lives. Yeah, man. You know, and that's not to say, I mean, we talk about this. I mean, we really do need to move toward plant-based diets. If you can figure out a way to go vegan, you know, I wouldn't talk you out of it, but I think we could make a big difference in the world if we could just move all of the meat eaters into one or two meals a week of meat. That'd be a big start. There's a separate issue of factory farming because that's independent of efficiency or environmental impact. Factory farming, that would be humanitarian and everyone's got to have their own values on that. But I know where I stand on that one. Yeah, yeah. I recommend more meals with vegans, at least ones who make delicious meals, because I think a delicious meal is more effective than an argument. There you go. Well, so speaking of vegan meals, electric vehicles, which some people use to go to get a vegan meal, back to the uh, price that we pay for manufacturing that electric vehicle. And I think most people are aware that it's a dirtier process to create one of those that, you know, you've got to have batteries to store the power and that the raw materials that go into batteries require mining and the recycling of those materials is problematic. So there's a lot of issues. It's far from a perfect solution unlike the perfect solution of just choosing fewer children. But anyway, they say that manufacturing one of the bigger long-range electric vehicles can create 68% more carbon emissions than manufacturing an equivalent gas-powered car. So there's a huge price just to making the car. And in fact, general rule of thumb that the carbon emissions of manufacturing a new electric vehicle are equal to the emissions of a year of driving it. And it can be more. There's a Volvo spinoff to create electric vehicles where they're trying to be really transparent. And I think they said that you've got to drive 58,000 miles. The emission savings of driving 58,000 miles will make up for the extra emissions of manufacturing that car. If the 58,000 miles were necessary to drive. (laughs) It's not like the more you drive, the less you pollute. Yeah, exactly. Important point. This reminds me of a weird, interesting case of, it was some mine where they had electric trains that would take stuff from the top of a mountain down to the bottom of the mountain. And because it used regenerative braking, it actually used negative energy. The round trip carrying the stuff down, I mean, they were using the potential energy stored up in the rocks at the top of the mountain. What about carbon offsets? Do you guys want to talk about those at all? I've read a lot and I haven't practiced enough to like put the case forward. But my takeaway was that Overall, by motivating more flights, it causes more pollution than it decreases. Generally, these are projects that would have happened anyway, and so it gets people to fly more. It comes from a mindset of to assuage feelings of guilt. I feel like a lot of people think that the more that they fly, as long as they offset it more than what they're flying, then it works out. And if you had a world full of people all doing that, you can see how quickly it would increase the pollution, the greenhouse emissions. Yeah, if you could completely separate the psychological part of it, the rationalization part of it, then, you know, maybe you could say, well, if you absolutely have to fly, flying and buying a carbon offset is better than just flying. But unfortunately, there's a whole lot of other complicated factors that make it hard to endorse carbon offsets. And you're right, you know, there's been studies done that have found that most of the projects would have been done anyway. And most of the time, flying means that you're taking fossil fuels out of the ground. Most carbon projects are shuffling carbon around. If you're just looking at the climate change effect, not talking about pollution, not talking about disrupting cultures and destroying landscapes to build the wells and so forth, or what it does to cultures, but moving stuff around It's just shuffling things around. Once you get it out from the ground and burn it, if there were giant projects that on a global scale could sequester greenhouse gases, 
that could possibly make a difference. But those don't exist now, and it may never happen that we can meaningfully and effectively sequester carbon dioxide and methane nitrous on the scale of the planet. So if we're just shuffling stuff around, even planting trees, that's a different cycle. Those trees will eventually decay and so forth. So you can rebuild forests, but you can't get a whole lot more forests than the earth once had, which only restores the forests. It only sequesters the amount of greenhouse gases in the forest. The stuff we took out of the ground, if we can't get it back in the ground, then we're just shuffling it around. That reminds me of population, of course. And even if we do stabilize our population, it's like, well, we still have, you know, 8 billion people here and we're still using just as much as we are and hopefully more because we want people in economically disadvantaged places to consume more because they deserve to, just like us. So it doesn't really solve the problem of our environmental impact. And then it's just impact at the end of the day. I always hear like, there's plenty of space. So if we're just shuffling people around and we're moving them to, you know, different spaces, yeah, sure, these places are becoming less densely populated, but we are still impacting the planet. Well, you know, and I don't want to beat you up about that, but it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. You know, we really need to change the way we talk about that because we want to provide space for the poorest people in the world to live better lives, to have their needs met. But I hate for us to define that in terms of consuming more just like us. I'd rather say have their needs met and have the opportunity to live decent lives. And the minute we start measuring their improvement by GDP, then we are sending them right on the same stupid path that we went down. And we know that that was a bad course of action. So I'd like to change the way we talk about how to improve the lives of the people who, in so many ways, you know, yeah, if their needs aren't being met, that's really a horrible existence. But let me be the first to tell you all, everybody around the world, that the way we're living today in the overdeveloped world, we don't get to do that in perpetuity. We got to stop. I mean, we didn't come up with the final answer. You know, we're on a suicide mission. You know, we do not need to give them a way to live like us. We need to be living a lot more like they do, and we all need to redefine the good life. End of soapbox. And my experience is that the online calculators tell me that I, or my impact is about 10% of the average Americans, which means it's, I've reduced about 90% my impact from five or 10 years ago. This has been almost pure life improvement and it's pure low hanging fruit. This is without searching for the hard stuff. I think the average American probably could easily knock out 75% of their consumption and impact with pure improvement. And now put a little effort in for things that'll take a bit of investment and you could get another 10, 20% probably from there. And It's really easy. I mean, in my case, once the mindset shift is there, then it's a fun thing to do to like find what's another thing I can do, what's another thing I can do, what's another thing I can do. Because I associate it so much with like fresh fruits and vegetables as opposed to all this packaged stuff, that makes a big difference. I mean, I live in New York, so my bed, my two sofas, my fridge, all Craigslist, my pressure cooker, my soy milk maker, there's all stuff I bought off Craigslist really cheap, and that really reduces a lot of impact. The not flying, you know, I took sailing lessons and the net savings is huge in terms of the money I spent. And the effect on my life is, I wish I could convey what it feels like to go sailing. It's not going to resonate with everyone the same as it did with me, but it's like much cheaper than flying. It's much more accessible. You know, I don't own a sailboat. There's a club that, and I just use their sailboats and they take care of the maintenance and stuff. These are just examples of things that are available. If you don't think you know, Christmas is about buying lots of material stuff. I guess the standard line is that happiness correlates with money as you reach a certain means and then it doesn't. And so if there are people who really are miserable because they don't know where the food is coming from, yes, we need more for them. But the developed world, if that's the right term, if everyone dropped 80% and got happier, I would love to see that. Yeah, that'd be big. Okay, one thing we haven't talked about is when we have to get in a car, the way we drive can make a big difference. And we're going to do an episode about that. So the next travel episode we do, we'll talk about eco-conscious driving and what we've learned about that. But to kind of wrap this up, Erica, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the subject. 
So you were saying, Dave, that it's really great when it's very easy to make these choices, to make the choice to take the bike or use your feet to go to the market if you live close by or to bike to work. Even our last guest, Dr. Michael Hall, even said, well, sometimes that's just not accessible. Unfortunately, I have to take the train to work if I don't live by the university I work at, or I have to you know, drive if I work an hour away and I'm not able to find a job closer to home. So yeah, what would you say to these people? I'll tell a story. When I was first getting started, before my podcast even started, there was a graduate student that I met at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Labs, which is the Earth Institute. This is someone who's dedicated his life to learning about nature in order to conserve nature. We were talking about reducing impact. And he said, you know, Josh, sometimes there's nothing I can do. For example, I work on geology and there's this formation in Australia that is the only place in the world where it is. There's nothing I can do about that. I can't change it. So I fly there. And I thought for a second and I said to him, could you ask someone in Australia to take pictures and measure it for you? He goes, oh yeah, I guess I could do that. Now, this doesn't apply to every situation, but this is a guy who has devoted his life to figuring out how to conserve nature. And maybe because someone else was paying for it, maybe because he wanted to go to Australia, but he wasn't seeing something that was a simple solution to his problem. And probably most people have a lot of things like that lying around. I don't know, everyone's unique, but I suspect that a lot of people who feel that they must fly or whatever, with a slight shift, they might see that there's lots of other things that they could do. Yeah, changing back from a five-day work week to a four-day work week or a three-day work week. In fact, I think one of the big solutions that we really hopefully will be embracing over the coming decade, hopefully we don't have to wait too long to get into that, is that we all ought to be working a lot less hours. If we're simplifying our lives by 75 or 80 percent, then we could live on less income. We could work less and drink our footprint. If we don't work less, the footprint of the work we do has an impact on the planet. Plus, you have that money coming in, you know, you're going to spend it. And when you spend it, you're creating carbon emissions, you know, along with a number of other negative environmental impacts. You know, there may not be a way to completely zero out the transportation issue impact or something like that. But there, like Josh said, there are other ways to skin that cat. We just need to think more creatively about it. Yeah. And also really utilizing your community. I think, Josh, you're really good at this. I don't know if it's natural to you, but it's not natural to me. And, you know, just before I sold my car here in California, I don't know if it's like that anywhere else or anywhere in the city, but here it's very much like people are almost like me centric. For me, now that I don't have a car, I'll ask my roommates, hey, can you take me here? Or I get to spend more time with my dad if he has extra time. Like, hey, can you take me here? So really trying to utilize your community and asking for help, just like you said, like, can you call somebody in Australia to take those pictures for you? Like, can you call somebody to bring you this if they're at the store instead of you having to go to the store? Just communicate more with people. And I know that's really hard because me asking for help is like, ugh, I want to do it on my own. But, you know, sometimes... It's better you have a stronger relationship with those people afterward and you're shrinking your footprint in the process. So, Well, I think the community idea is a great one, you know, sharing things, helping each other. And then my final thought would be, you know, temporarily we're going to have 8 billion people on the planet. Hopefully we're not going to actually end up with 11. We're going to peak and we're going to shrink back down to three or four that Josh mentioned, or maybe even less than that. But even if we end up at 3 billion people on the planet in 100 years, you know, that's a lot of people and that's a lot of power. And if those 3 billion people all wake up every day and go through their day thinking, how can I not waste what we've been given? How can I live responsibly? How can I minimize my impact on the planet? How can I leave room for my neighbors? How can I leave room for the other species on the planet? And if that just is second nature to be applying that filter to every decision you make, it's not hard work. It just comes naturally eventually. You know, don't you kind of just live that way, Josh? I mean, every time you walk into a building and you decide whether you're going to take the stairs or get in an elevator, boom, It just comes naturally. You don't just automatically get into the elevator and burn electricity to go up three flights of stairs. This is what meaning and purpose comes from, is our relationships with others. 
as well as with ourselves, our emotional and social connections. And these come through community. These come through helping each other. These come through taking consideration to how our behavior affects others. I think it's the potential to improve one's life through community and these things that require less power, less stuff. It generally improves your life. It doesn't seem that way if you're deep into whoever dies with the most toys wins, but we descended from people who had every amount of happiness that we do, but they didn't need all the stuff. Fascinating conversation. Thank you for having me. Joshua Spodek will include a link in the show notes to your podcast, which has a cool new name. What's the new name again? This Sustainable Life. This Sustainable Life. I like that. Oh, and I have to add that there are now offshoots. There's This Sustainable Life Sweden. There's This Sustainable Life Untethered, which comes out of the UK. Soon we'll launch This Sustainable Life in Italy. There's going to be one that comes out of Kyoto, Japan, which is based on engineering and sustainable science. And more to come soon after that. So it's a growing family, each reaching different audiences. So if different audience is your thing, then you could start another branch yourself. Cool. That sounds like leadership to me. Well, that was an excellent end to our travel series. Dave, what do you think about it? I think it was pretty good, but I got to tell you, it's not the end. We're going to do one more episode. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully where we get to talk more about beating the system. Well, we might have another one there too. I want to do one more about eco-driving, hypermiling, just about if you have to be in a car, how you can change your driving habits to shrink the footprint. So I've got one more that I want to do. And maybe we tack on the system conversation to that or, you know, we're always talking about the system. But if you've got another whole episode, I'm game. You can tell I'm a little stuck on that. And I think what I really took from this conversation with Josh is that it all begins with self-efficacy, a willingness to engage with your community, and just being open to new ideas that could help you beat that system. And that just because it seems almost impossible for us to get away from driving every single day or hopping on a plane, there are solutions and we should just be open to them. So yeah. I'm never going to put a stop sign in front of you on that subject. You know, we're very much in sync on that, Erica. So we should definitely do that. Before we completely wrap up this episode, though, I wanted to offer a Hummer EV update. We teased this episode with the Hummer EV. And, of course, I talked about the fact that I wanted a Hummer at one point in my foolish younger days. So I just saw something interesting in the newspaper just the other day about how The Hummer Edition 1, the electric Hummer that's going to be available late in 2021, it's got a starting price of $112,000, almost $113,000. Three electric motors. It's got underbody cameras so you can watch what's going on under the vehicle while you're four-wheeling and you're about to hit a rock that you can't clear or something like that. I don't know. It seems to me like you're going to destroy the cameras. But anyway, the update that I have for you is that... They sold out when they opened pre-orders. It took 10 minutes for them to sell out the whole year's worth of production of that first edition of the Hummer EV. General Motors won't even tell us how much the thing is going to weigh. But with its payload, it's expected to be over five tons. Dealers are having to install stronger lifts in their service base just to lift this vehicle up. You know what? That qualifies as excess. So I just thought it you know, would bear a little bit of extra comment. It is extra. It's way beyond anything we need. And the fact that the pre-order sold out in 10 minutes tells us just how much work we have to do ahead of us still. And, you know, and of course they advertise it as uh, zero emissions, the world's first zero emissions, zero limits, all electric super truck. So I just thought it would be worth having a little sidebar about, yes, we really do want to get rid of our gas guzzling fossil fuel powered vehicles that you know we don't want to be powering our transportation with that anymore and electric powered transportation is going to be an improvement but you know it's still energy and we haven't talked about this a lot and maybe we need to have an episode about this about how ahead of us is going to be a reduced energy future we can't shift to renewables and be consuming as much energy in our lifestyles as we have been on fossil fuels. This was just kind of a temporary blip where we were able to just have excess energy out the wazoo. When we're running the world on electricity, 
that is generated with renewables, we're going to have to be really careful to make fewer energy demands. Because if we don't, well, just think about that Hummer. It's a great example. It's got three electric motors to make it go zero to 60 in three seconds and have a thousand horsepower and do all these incredible things and power all the underbody cameras and all that. How many batteries do you think that's going to take to run those three motors? And do you think those batteries are like free manna from heaven? No. How much mining has to take place to get the raw materials for those batteries? And what happens when those batteries have outlived their useful life? Yeah, we're getting better at recycling the components of batteries, but there's still going to be some waste. So our future is not the Hummer EV. Our future is your feet and your legs and your bicycle and the train. (laughs) (laughs) So I just wanted to you know, preach a little more about that. You know, I hadn't seen this update about the Hummer when we recorded that conversation with you and me and Joshua back in November. But there's an update and Dave's sermon related. You know, to make you sound like a little less judgy (laughs) about anybody who's going to buy these, I'm going to go ahead and one up you because this is a travel episode and it is also going to be released right after the Christmas holiday. But one thing, Dave, that I cannot stand is families going out in their cars, driving around for like an hour, looking at the Christmas lights. Like, why is it so hard to just get off your butt and walk? I am so glad you brought that up. It kills me. (laughs) It really kills me. And then, you know, not just because I gave up my car this year, but, you know, this has been killing me for, gosh, since I've been a child. I mean, I always ask my parents, like, can we just walk? Can we just walk and not take the car? Like, yeah, it's cold, but just bundle up. Make it a fun thing. And actually, there are neighborhoods here in Southern California. I got to go a couple years back with one of my good friends where they actually block off the streets. So you can't go through with car. You have to walk around. And then they also hand out wine and hot chocolate and things that will hopefully motivate more people to walk. Well, I think that highlights that the days of recreational driving are over. You know, that's recreational driving. That's going out for a Sunday drive. That's what we used to do back in the old days, long before you were born. You probably never went for a Sunday drive, but that's what families used to do. Henry Fonda and Maureen O'Hara, I guess. I don't know. But those days are over in this low energy future. They've got to be. And I'm going to see you and raise you one because I saw an ad in the paper the other day for helicopter rides to go look at the Christmas lights. Stop it. Oh, stop it. No. I am not kidding you. This is why Halloween is my favorite holiday and Christmas takes a back seat. What is this about? Seriously, a helicopter? How far away from the lights do you have to be? (laughs) Well, the people offering those, the people buying those, the people ordering these Hummers, they have never heard an episode of the Growth Busters podcast, clearly. So we have our work cut out for us. Mm -hmm. They also don't know that they have two legs and two feet. They can walk and get some exercise. (laughs) Yeah, but we're not going to blame you if you just haven't been enlightened about the fact that we are deep into overshoot and that if you want your children or other people's children or future generations to, you know, have a planet worth inheriting, that we've got to scale back a little bit. And that's why the Hummer is not in our future and neither are helicopter rides or Sunday drives. Exactly. So shout out to any parents who are taking their children walking. It starts with you, your excellent parents, and your kids will do the same with their future children. So kudos to you. Thank you. And on that positive note, I think we can wrap. So thanks again to Joshua Spodek for joining us. Don't forget to explore issues at growthbusters.org. If you think this podcast is important, subscribe to the podcast on your podcast app and recommend it to your friends. If you haven't seen the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, it's easy enough to find at growthbustersmovie.org or on Amazon. Until next time, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Let's make sure there's a bright future for us and especially for future generations. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling.
calling, 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 calling. 